tells you exactly the order in which the, um, uh, the evaluations are supposed to happen. So uh, S applied to T translate is let Z be translation of S in let X be translation of T in Z applied to X. And if you check everything, this has the, um, has the right type. <coughs> so there's a call by valence translation from the lambda calculus into the computational meta language. And then there's also a call by name translation for PCF, which doesn't really use the T anywhere except on coproducts. And then there's a lifted call by name translation, which is the thing that corresponds to Haskell, which puts in a whole bunch of T's everywhere. Um, has a slightly different shape. You'll see here the functions here in Haskell <coughs> take computations to computations, which corresponds to the fact that the, the things that you pass are unevaluated. <coughs> in fact, this notion of having a meta language into which we can translate uh, other languages, um, call by name and call by value languages, and express um, their semantics uh, via a kind of common interpretation of the target language. Um, it's something we've seen before. It goes back to, well, at least Plotkin's uh, work in 1975. And it's uh, continuation passing style. So um, there's a well-known translation of call by name and call by value programming languages into um, the lambda calculus, which adds in to every function a continuation, another function, so you take an argument and then you take a second argument, which is a continuation, a function, which is what you're going to do with the result. And there are, there are styles of translation, there are different styles of translation of lambda calculus into this continuation passing style. Um, so here's a call by value translation in an application. So, uh, so if you translate this thing, it's going to be something which takes a continuation, which is what you're going to do with the result of the whole application. And then you take the translation of M, which is a function, because that's the first thing you're going to do. Um, and uh, that thing will then will evaluate and is fed a continuation here, which expects the result of evaluating M, which will be a function F. And that continuation itself evaluates N and feeds that a continuation, which expects the X, which will come out of N. And what that continuation does is it takes the F that you had here, it applies it to X and the continuation that you were passed in in the first place. <coughs> Um, if you put types on that, it all becomes a little bit clearer. So the CPS transform type of uh, A arrow B is uh, a, 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 um, a translate arrow, B translate arrow R, arrow R, which is isomorphic to B translate arrow R, arrow A translate arrow R. So you can see this has kind of flipped the order around. These are uh, continuation transformers. So a function from A to B in continuation passing style, it says, well, you tell me what you want to do with the, uh, with the B, and I'll tell you what I do with the A. Okay. But an exciting fact about the CPS translations that was in, in uh, uh, Plotkin's paper is that whether you have call by name or call by value, if you do these different translations uh, into CPS, the, the CPS transformations actually have uh, operational behavior which is independent of the evaluation order that you, uh, uh, that you apply to them. Or equationally, full beta and eta are applicable to the target terms that you get out of this translation. And in actual fact, you get better equational reasoning about the source language than you did with that lambda v calculus. So those, those rules with side conditions that said you could do beta if you have a value and so forth, they don't let you prove as many equations about call by value programs as you would like. But if you translate them into CPS and do unrestricted um, uh, beta and eta reasoning, uh, then you prove more valid equations about the source than you did with those restricted things. And in fact, <coughs> if we take T of X to be this continuation monad, X L O R L O R, where R is some result type for the output, then these tricky, tricky continuation passing transformations are exactly the monadic transformations that we have before. So the, um, uh, the CPS transformations are, that we knew already were just a, a special case of the general monadic transformation. In fact, this is the only way that I can ever remember the <coughs> CPS transformations is to factor it through the, through the monadic thing and then go back in and fill in uh, eta in the extension operation for for continuations. And another nice thing about this is that it gives us a nicer account of what's called administrative reduction. So if you do CPS transformation, then um, well, if you do it uniformly and uh, compositionally, there are lots of values and things in your, in your source term, you end up with a CPS transformation transform term which has an enormous number of lambda abstractions and applications in, many of which can be reduced immediately. Um, and some of those, you can see, uh, they're sort of to do with having a suboptimal CPS transformation. And some of the redexes in there are redexes from your original program. 
Um, and so the older literature on CPS transformation makes some fuss about trying to kind of tag the lambdas. So and it's all in the lambda calculus, but some of the lambdas were kind of lambdas that were there in your original program, and some of the lambdas are ones that were added as a result of, uh, of the CPS transformation itself. And so some people kind of tag them and put bars on them and do different reductions. But here, we've actually got a different type constructor for those things. So um, you can transform into, uh, into the monadic meta language, and then you've got beta and eta on T types, which are the administrative reductions. Um, and are independent of the, uh, th th those are separated for, uh, uh, by types from the reductions from the uh, original program language. Okay. <coughs> so we've got this category, um, which has got uh, a Cartesian closed structure on it, and it's got a monad uh, on top. So this is, so this is an endo function. It's something that takes objects back into objects in the same category. And there's a couple of other categories that we can construct once we've got uh, uh, this base category with a monad on it. And one of them is the quasi-category. <coughs> so assume we start with our category C, um, and it's got a quasi-triple T, eta, and this extension operation on it. We can make a new category from that, which C sub T, called the quasi-category. And the objects of this category are the same objects as the category we started with, but the set of morphisms, set of maps, are going to be different. So the collection of maps from A to B in the quasi-category is defined to be equal to the set of maps from A into TB in the category that you first thought of. <coughs> so what we need to show that this is a category is we need identities and we need composition. So uh, the identity in CT, so we need a map in CT from A to A, and that means we need a map from A to T of A back in the category we, we first thought of. And luckily we have just such a gadget, ETA, right? So that was part of the um, original definition of closed triple. So the, the identity in the closed category is given by ETA. Uh, of, the, of the triple, and composition, if we have <coughs> F in CT uh, from A to B, and G from B to C, we need to be able to compose them, get from A to C, and this extension operator does, does the job exactly. Um, so uh, we first do F, we get from uh, A, A to TB in the category we first thought of, and then this thing goes from B into TC, so we star it to go from TB into TC, and then we can perform the composition. So the conditions on quasi triples that I had on the slide before, you remember there was this thing about um, uh, eta of t being the identity on t, and there are two, two triangles. Uh, in fact, those conditions are exactly, exactly the conditions that say that this quasi category is a category, that the identities and compositions uh, uh, work out. So if you can't remember what those diagrams are, they're the diagrams that make the quasi category um, a category. So the shape of this, morphisms in the quasi category from A to B are from A to TB, so that's exactly the shape of this core by value translation that we had before. So the core by value interpretation of our effectful programs can be seen as living in a separate category, um, uh, the, uh, the quasi category. <coughs> so there's a second category we can make once we've got a, um, a strong monad on our category, and this is called the island Boys more category. <coughs> so I think I just have time to explain it. So the island Boys more category, C uh, uh, superscript T, the objects of that are called T algebras. <coughs> so this is a little bit harder to explain than the Clasi category. So these are, these are maps in the category we first thought of from TA into A. So you remember what we had in the definition of a monad, we had a way from going A to TA, and we could go from T squared A to TA. So you can see that once you've gone up into, into TA, there's generally no way to go back into A unless the, the thing was already of a, of a T form. <coughs> Um, so algebras are things where you do have a map going from TA back down into A. And they have to satisfy some conditions. So they say if you're in A and you go up into TA with eta and then come down again, it's the same as the identity. Um, and uh, similarly, they play nice with, uh, with mu. And a morphism between two of these guys, so an object here is now, this is a map from TA, uh, so a map alpha from TA to A, which satisfies these conditions, is one object of the category, and a map beta from TB into B, which satisfies these conditions, is another. And a map from here to here is a map underneath from A to B, such that when you, take, when you lift that with the functor, with, with the monad T, um, this diagram commutes. Okay, so uh, F from A to B, uh, precomposed alpha is the same as taking T of F and beta. So these are called homomorphisms of, of T algebras. <coughs> So uh, they're called algebras because they generalize the familiar notion of algebra that, uh, that you know from, from universal algebra. So, um, so if you have a, a signature sigma, so this is a collection of operations and arities of those things, then we can make a monad over sets where T sub sigma of X is 
the set of all terms in this signature whose variables come from the set X. Okay, so sigma you know, might say we have a single binary operation and a constant, for example, be the, the signature for monoids. <coughs> um, and, um, well, actually, we also want an associativity condition, but we'll come to that. Um, so, um <coughs> So this is a monad um, on set, so because what you need, you need a way of taking um, x into t of x, so this will be our eta, and that's the inclusion of variables into, uh, into terms in this uh, signature, and we need this Claisley operation. <coughs> so if you have a map from x to ty, think of this as one set of variables, and then this is terms built over another set of variables y, then that's a substitution. This says for every variable x, I'm going to give you a term over y. So it's a thing that you can apply to terms built over x. Okay? So then that's just what this Claisley lifting does. So if f from x to ty is seen as a substitution, then f star is the application of that to terms built over x, which takes a big term over x and recursively descends through it, finding all the variables, and then applies this substitution at the end of the day. Um, and one way of seeing that is that you're building a term whose variables live in ty um, and then flattening that, uh, flattening that out. 